Okay, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Good afternoon. We welcome you to Oregon State University's Ecology, Evolution, and Conservation Biology Seminar Series. First, we would like to thank the Departments of Forest e Ecosystems and Society, Fisheries and Wildlife, Integrative Biology, as well as Forest Biodiversity uh, Research Network and the Oregon State University Research Office. And of course, special thank you to Amanda Polly for running the technical aspects of Zoom and YouTube. So I would like to introduce you to our speaker today, Dr. Winifred Frick. She is the Chief Scientist at Bat Conservation International and an Associate, Associate Research Professor in Ecology and Evolutionary Biology at UC Santa Cruz. Dr. Frick has studied bats for 20 years and has worked all around the world, including places such as Mexico, Rwanda, Guinea, Fiji, and Jamaica to study and protect bat populations. Dr. Frick has published over 70 research papers, including research appearing in high impact science journals such as Science, Nature, and PNAS. In fact, just yesterday, her newest paper was released in Science and featured in the New York Times. She has worked extensively on disease ecology and conservation of bats impacted by the fungal disease white nose syndrome in hibernating bats in North America. And as chief scientist at Bat Conservation International, she directs high priority research and development of scalable solutions for achieving meaningful conservation outcomes for bats. There are over 1400 species. Bats are the second most diverse group of mammals on earth, yet many species are threatened by forces of global change. During the COVID-19 pandemic, she has been a vocal spokesperson for the importance of conservation as part of our solutions for global health. Dr. Frick re received her PhD in forest science at Oregon State University. We thank her for returning to the Beaver State today to speak and are excited to learn more about the relevancy of bat research and conservation to global health. All right, thank you, Dr. Frick. Thank you, Lindsay. So um, thanks for that lovely introduction. I'm gonna, it's a pleasure to be on with everybody today. I'm gonna share my screen. I wanna, um, I need to share one thing, which is that I, um, I was really pleased to see the um, the, the coverage in, in both the science perspective and the New York Times, but that's actually not my research. That's uh, research that's re very related to what we're going to be talking about today, but um, but it was done by colleagues of mine, not my not myself. So um, it's a great pleasure to be here and talking with everybody about the relevancy of bat research and conservation to global health. Um, so as we were just talking about, um, my talk is really nicely teed up today um, with um, a recent article that was published in um, the New York Times um, that appeared yesterday that says what's special about bat viruses and what we don't know could hurt us. Um, and I just love the, the tagline here, the immune systems of bats are weird, but what we don't know, um, but we don't know how weird or how they got that way or enough about other animals. Um, and I, this first paragraph really sort of captures um, really kind of the, the, the main takeaway from my whole talk. So I'm just gonna read it to, to kind of kick us off, which is bats were once of interest mainly to specialists and devoted conservationists like me, um, but the global pandemic pushed the animals squarely into the spotlight as the apparent original source of the novel coronavirus. Now, once arcane research into the large number of viruses that live in bats has acquired a new urgency, along with discussions of what to do about the likelihood of diseases and animals spilling over to humans. Um, and so that, that is um, what we're gonna be talking about today is um, a little bit about why bats um, are, have been in the spotlight and then the ways in which um, understanding both uh, do, conducting bat research and the importance of bat conservation uh, to global health. So of course the New York Times article um, was written in response to a, a science perspective that appeared in this week's um, uh, issue of science entitled Contextualing Bats as Viral Reservoirs um, uh, by Dan Stryker and Amy Gilbert. Um, and this is just the most recent um, article um, that has appeared. There's been quite a few review pieces that have been appearing over the last couple months since the um, pandemic started. I'm um, really um, exploring and um, describing what we know about um, bat-borne virus diversity, the risk of spillover and, and emergence. Um, and so, um, you know, there's been a lot of a, a lot of interest and a lot of really great work, and this is built on, um, you know, over a decade of work that has really explored um, um, trying to better understand the role that bats may play um, as uh, natural hosts um, to um, viral pathogens. 
Um, so why exactly have bats been in the spotlight? Um, it's really important to note that um, exactly how SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID, um, is still under scientific, how it got into the human population is still under scientific investigation. We don't actually know how um, this virus got um, into the human population. What we do know is that um, the evolutionary origins and, and there's a, a diversity of SARS-like beta coronaviruses um, that are found in um, horseshoe bats. Uh, in fact, there is a, a closely related strain uh, to SARS-CoV-2 that has been found in Rhinolophus affinus, a horseshoe bat that's found in China. Um, in addition to um, the coronaviruses, which are associated with um, uh, not just COVID, but um, the, the SARS epidemic um, and MERS, um, uh, the Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome. Um, uh, there's also spillover events of Nipah viruses. So uh, the Nipah virus and the Hendra virus, and those have been um, also uh, linked to uh, having natural um, reservoirs in bat populations, in this case, flying fox populations. So in the case of Hendra, um, flying foxes in Australia are the natural host. Um, and it can spill over into horses, which act as an intermediate host, um, and then can um, spill into people. Um, and in the case of Nipah, um, uh, um, that's also found in flying fox populations, um, and in Malaysia, it can spill over through um, pigs as an intermediate uh, reservoir, and um, in Bangladesh, it actually um, spilled um, through um, bats um, licking uh, date um, palm sap that uh, people were collecting. Of course, the most uh, famous um, or, or widely known um, um, uh, viral pathogen that is in bats is rabies, and this is a, um, a vampire bat. So, um, you know, there's many, many things that make bats um, incredibly fascinating to study and also really important in terms of their ecological value um, and, and the roles that they play. Um, and, and so in addition to uh, this uh, um, diverse body of research that has been investigating um, the disease ecology, um, there's also um, a, a diverse amount of, of work going on globally to better understand the ecology and conservation of bats. And bats are incredibly diverse. Um, they, there's over 1400 different species that have been described and um, we're continually describing new species every year. Um, they make up um, about 20% of all mammal diversity around the world. And bats are the only uh, mammal that's capable of true flight, and this ability to fly um, is, is par partly explains probably their, um, their wide diversity, and they're also um, very widely distributed on the planet. So bats occur on every continent um, except for Antarctica. And this ability to fly may also explain some of the things that are really unusual about their immune systems. Um, bats have, as the New York Times article put, they have really weird immune systems. They seem to be very underwhelmed um, by, um, uh, by pathogen, uh, by, by, by viruses, and they don't mount a, a super intense um, immune response. Um, and, but why exactly that is, is still an area of active research to, to understand. Um, uh, flight does, one aspect of flight is that it constrains uh, the reproductive potential um, of bats. So this is a myotis species and you can see the pup um, on her. Um, and um, other myota species have been noted to live for several decades. So, you know, usually when we think about small animals, um, we think about um, uh, like high reproductive output and um, and short lifespans. But because bats fly and, and as a mammal, um, you can't you know, have a large litter. <laughs> um, and, um, and so they're constrained to one pup per year um, and that low reproductive output, um, uh, they have to compensate for that in some life history strategy. And so they tend to live uh, longer than we would expect for a, um, an animal of their size. And just to drive home this point about how in, um, uh, the, the type of investment they put into their young. Um, and also just because I love the story of, of, of highlighting just what great parents, uh, uh, great moms bats are. This is a species I work on, the lesser long-nosed bat. 
um, that's found throughout Mexico and into the southwestern US. It's a migratory species and these females actually migrate uh, when they're pregnant. She has just arrived on it to her, the area where she will uh, give birth um, on the Baja Peninsula. And you can see she's very, very pregnant. Um, and this is a pup that is just a couple days old. So this is the size of a newborn pup. Um, and you can just see how large that pup is relative to the mom's body size. Um, and then <laughs> she, the mom will go ahead and nurse this pup um, up until uh, uh, it's about this, the, the equivalent size of a teenager. So I think all of us who are parents of young children uh, in this pandemic and trying to multitask and have, have ever felt like a sense of violation of personal space from your young children can really relate to the, uh, the personal space violation that this mom bat is, is experiencing nursing her uh, equivalent a child that's the size of a teenager. Um, it's been very well documented the really important value that bats have um, to human economies. Um, notably, most bats are insectivorous and um, it's been well documented the economic value that bats provide uh, to farmers. Here in the United States, um, uh, bats uh, provide um, in the billions every year annually to the US agricultural industry. Um, and um, uh, these economic benefits have also been documented in other parts of the world. So an example in Thailand, um, it's estimated that um, uh, bats consuming uh, common rice uh, crop pests um, uh, uh, basically um, are, um, uh, it was worth a value of about one $1.2 million uh, US dollars annually. And it's about 2,900 tons of rice uh, or enough food for 26,000 people in Thailand. Um, the economic value has also been um, estimated in Spain um, where uh, another species of bat um, um, uh, consumes um, uh, a different type of rice crop pests. And that's been estimated about 21 euros per hectare. So there's quantifiable value that bats are providing to, to the um, agricultural industry around the world. Um, bats are also really important pollinators um, in tropical latitudes, and they disperse seeds and pollinate plants for more than a thousand tropical plants, including some plants of, of significant commercial value, such as durian in Southeast Asia. Um, and then uh, an example a little closer to home for us, but tequila and pitaya fruit, which is actually a very um, popular um, cactus fruit. Um, in Mexico. This is the lesser long-nosed bat. This is the same bat um, I was showing you um, with the babies uh, pollinating a Cardone cactus in, in Mexico. Um, and then in tropical rainforest, bats are really important um, seed dispersers and can move large seeds um, long distances and play critical roles in terms of um, uh, rainforest um, dynamics. When we think about uh, bats, often the first images we have are thinking about um, cave dwelling bats and certainly and the majority of bats do um, live in caves or, well, sorry, not the majority, 40% of the world's bat species um, live in caves. Um, bats are also really dependent on forest um, uh, landscapes. Um, but this, this um, the species that aggregate in large numbers in caves, um, uh, a, they form spectacular um, emergences. This is Bracken Cave that um, is in, in Texas and is a place where you can actually go and watch uh, bats emerge and, and get to experience this. Um, but um, it, they also are not so good at the social distancing. So this high degree of, of sociality, of packing in really closely and living in really close quarters um, may also play a role in terms of um, uh, their unique abilities to, um, to withstand different types of um, viruses. Um, and from a conservation perspective, um, lots of caves can actually host many different um, uh, species. So this is a cave that we work on in Jamaica that has upwards of about a dozen different bat species living in one cave. And so this habit of uh, living in large numbers um, in um, concentrated places underground is both um, puts bat populations at risk in terms of um, if something were to happen to these um, areas uh, through disturbance or, or persecution or, um, uh, or, or disruption, um, that you can have a disproportional impact um, to biodiversity conservation, but they also then provide um, an opportunity because they are concentrated targeted areas where we can have a really high um, uh, action to impact ratio in terms of 
directed targeted conservation can make a big difference for keeping these um, species um, on the planet. So going back to um, thinking about contextualizing bats as bio reservoirs in this in this paper that just came out, um, they provided a nice um, overview um, of thinking about all the different kind of um, uh, factors that are at play when we think about um, the opportunity for zoonotic um, uh, spillover. And it and there's you know there's a lot <laughs> going on in this figure in terms of thinking about the evolutionary drivers, the intrinsic factors, the social structure and population biology, the community ecology, um, and then the interface between um, the bats and their ecology and the and the broader context of, of what's happening and the kinds of impacts we as humans are having on our planet. I want to give a shout out too to some of the foundations of this work. So Raina Plowright's lab um, in uh, Montana State, Raina Plowright's a, a professor at Montana State University, and she works with a diverse group of um, researchers through the Bat One Health Network. Um, and, and she's worked extensively on, on the spillover of Hendra um, in Australia and has done a really great job of thinking about the ways these, the complexity and the different kinds of expertise that you need to have to understand this risk of spillover of, and kind of presents this model of thinking about um, spillover risk being related to these, there's these natural barriers. Um, and when you um, disturb systems and you line things up, then you get, um, you know, you get the opportunity for spillover. Um, and, and, and so it's important to be thinking about the integration of all the different kinds of expertise that you have to have to understand um, um, spillover, um, and that you really need to bring, be bringing people in who understand ecology and conservation, as well as virology and immunology um, and disease ecology. But understanding the science and pulling together the different components of this science um, allows us to also then think about ways that we can take actions to prevent and manage um, spillover. And so this is a kind of a follow-up paper. And note that these papers are all pre-pandemic, right? This is all, this is 2019. Um, it's really prescient um, that there are ecological interventions that we can take by thinking about the, the natural barriers and then thinking about which ways in which we can do interventions that sort of plug those holes that, um, that line up to, um, for spillover to occur. So, I like this example because it really demonstrates the role of, of using science and, um, and the importance of understanding what's happening in our wildlife populations, um, what's happening both at the organismal level as well as the ecological level, and then um, the role that conservation um, comes into play in terms of, of, of protecting both wildlife as well as ourselves. Um, and so, you know, returning back to here, you know, my job um, as a chief scientist of a nonprofit that's dedicated to um, the conservation and protection of bat species, you know, I'm struck by what's at the what's on what's on the top bar here, right? Um, and and what immediately occurred to me when I read this this morning is that you know I had recently um, published a paper. Um, uh, with some colleagues looking at what are the primary threats to bats around the world. And the primary threats to bats around the world all line up here with the things that really matter in terms of our, our spillover risk. So the job that, that, that we have of trying to protect bats is part and parcel um, to also um, reducing spillover risk and, and, and protecting ourselves. So I just wanted to run through a little bit of these um, of these um, top line threats. So I think we're all familiar with the threat of habitat loss and habitat degradation. Um, humans have had an extraordinary impact on the planet um, in terms of uh, land use change. And even areas that are nominally protected um, are experiencing different kinds of habitat loss and habitat destruction. So this is an area we work in Guinea um, that is actually in a World Heritage Site um, and that um, uh, because of pressure of, of local communities um, doing uh, engaging in, 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 um, in land conversion that even in within the protected area, um, there's a lot of um, slash and burn agri uh, slash and burn happening. Um, and, and then um, in large parts of the world, um, um, bats um, are an important source of protein 
um, for people. Um, there's about about 13% of um, the world's bat species um, are are eaten for food. Um, in 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 many places, it's because um, uh, com human communities are protein deficient. Um, in other areas, it's an important cultural um, part of the diet. Um, but understanding um, the the it, you know the, um, the reasons why bats are on the menu and under, and, and coming up with solutions to um, either um, regulate hunting in a way that's sustainable um, or provide alternative protein sources um, is going to be really important, especially in areas in which um, uh, where, when bats are on islands and there's um, a, a limited amount of, of, of hunting that can be sustainable. Likewise, um, you know, perhaps um, unique to bats is this threat of human intrusions and disturbance. Like I mentioned, bats being concentrated in, in subterranean um, types of habitats um, uh, really opens up the opportunity for a, a disproportional in, impact of disturbance um, uh, on those. This, on the left here, this is a bit of an extreme example, but this is actually a cave in Jamaica um, and was formerly a roost of the Jamaican flower bat, which is now a critically endangered bat and is only known from uh, basically one, one remaining ca uh, cave site in Jamaica. Um, obviously, this uh, picture on the left is no longer um, suitable habitat. And uh, lots, lot, many parts of the world, um, uh, guano harvesting is a uh, an important part of subsistence agriculture. Uh, bat guano is very rich in nitrogen and um, can is used as a fertilizer. And there are ways in which guano can be um, harvested sustainably, but it takes outreach and communication and working with local communities to make sure that um, guano is harvested in a way that is not um, impacting bat populations and is also um, uh, safe for people and bats. If we look um, globally and we use the IUCN, the um, International Union for the Conservation of Nature's Red List, which is a sort of a global um, <clears throat> effort to kind of categorize and, and take stock of, of species, um, it turns out that there's you know, similar levels of, of, of threat and status um, uh, of bats, but um, to compared to other mammals or birds, but there's actually significantly more bats that are considered data deficient um, than for other mammals or birds. Um, and this data deficiency is a concern because oftentimes data deficient um, animals or species are um, also imperiled or rare in some way. Um, but more concerning is that of the species that are not considered threatened by the IUCN. So um, IUCN um, has this ranking and, and species that are considered least concerned or near threatened are in their unthreatened um, category. And if you look at the population trends um, that are listed um, for those unthreatened species, uh, there are oh, 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 about 60% of our bat species, we don't know um, their population trend. And then another quarter have um, a decreasing population trend. So but to, uh, over three quarters of the um, bat species that are classified by IUC, IUCN um, have either unknown or decreasing uh, population trends, meaning that less than a quarter of the fauna um, should be considered stable or increasing. So if we tally this up, um, there's uh, about 186 species that are considered threatened by IUCN categories and 234 that are considered data deficient. But of these unthreatened categories, um, 125 species are non-threatened, of non-threatened have declining population trends so that should be worried about them at some level. And 456 species of non-threatened have unknown population trends. So if we sum all that up, we get to a whopping 1,000 bat species or 80% of the classified fauna that need either conservation or research attention. And this can feel really overwhelming just for context. Like when I became a bat biologist 20 years ago, we didn't even have that many species described. Um, I think there was like 900 at the time that I became, 900 described species when I became a bat biologist. And so, you know, a little bit like the context of feeling about being overwhelmed by, by climate change is like, you can kind of get in this state of paralysis of like, well, what do we do, right? And, um, but, you know, there's actually 
a lot that we can do. And I think it's really important that we, we focus on what we can do um, and, and, we, and we pick something and we do it. Um, and so to me, that's one of, been one of the things that's been so rewarding about working for uh, Bat Conservation International the last couple of years um, is that we are really rallying around this vision behind um, um, doing results-driven focused conservation work um, and, and, and also um, messaging about the importance of bats um, and, and the importance of conservation work around the world. Um, and so we've recently rolled out our new um, strategic plan and, and, and we as an organization are focusing on a sort of th four core areas of our work portfolio. So um, we're working on endangered species interventions. We've picked a, um, a suite of species that are critically endangered, mostly like down to just like a single known cave site and where we have the ability to take action and do something that's feasible and will have impact. Um, we're working on restoring and, and protecting landscapes. And a lot of that's focused on, on protecting roosts um, and cave roosts, but also thinking about the role of foraging habitat and how do we um, restore foraging habitats, um, but also protect foraging habitats near um, um, uh, important roost sites. Um, and then thinking too about the research that we need to do, what are the key data gaps that we're missing? Um, what are the kinds of questions that we need to answer to be able to inform real decision uh, decisions that can um, enable conservation and thinking about the ways that we scale conservation and make it implementable um, to, to be able to have an impact um, in, in, at, at various scales from local to, to global. And then lastly, um, you know, wor like working through um, building a community um, that is that is interested and engaged in a part uh, of the work that we do. And so um, we're work we have a, um, a new program that's called our Bat Walks program where we're actually doing, you know, outreach and getting people out with with bat detectors and um, uh, listening to bats um, and, and learning about them. Um, you know, being a bat biologist is um, always been about <laughs> standing up for the underdog um, and, um, and messaging about um, just how fascinating and um, interesting this group of organisms are. They have not always had a great reputation, um, but I think we've, we've made a lot of uh, progress in, in, um, over the decades in terms of, you know, for the most part, people, you know, really um, sure there's, you know, some proportion of, of the public out there that's always not going to be into wildlife and not going to be into bats, but a lot of people are really fascinated um, and, and um, excited about, about bats. But there was this fear that bats becoming up and getting up back into the spotlight and in association um, with um, COVID that, that we would see some backlash and see some um, a return to sort of the scapegoating um, type of um, um, messaging. But there's been an incredible response on the part of the bat uh, research and conservation community to really um, come out with positive messaging, to work together, um, and to really message the, the importance um, and, um, and value that bats have around the world. And that's been incredibly encouraging and to be a part of and, and to witness the sense of kind of global community and connection um, that people have and, and willingness to sort of stand up and, and, and be positive. And I can't really, um, you know, talk about that without giving a specific shout out to four outstanding scientists. Um, um, and my colleagues, Dr. Tigga Kingston, Dr. Nancy Simmons, Dr. Liliana Davalos, and Dr. Susan Singh, who have stood up this idea of a, a global network of networks, the Global Union of Bat Diversity Networks. Um, this idea came from an, a, a book chapter that Tigga wrote a number of years ago. And then in 2016 at the International Bat Research Conference, back when the good old days when you could go to conferences and have drinks with colleagues. Um, we toasted the, to the idea of putting together a way of, of connecting all of the different um, regional bat conservation networks around the world. And TIG has really led this, um, led this vision forward and, um, um, and, and catalyzed this this spring um, with COVID, um, bringing this group together and, and, and really getting, um, a, you know, 
social media channel set up and in a, in a blog post to, to put out um, positive messaging. And then just a couple of weeks ago, they received the great news that they have been funded through an NSF um, a grant to um, really formalize and catalyze this network. So um, in conclusion, um, this was going to be the, um, the beginning of my talk. Oops. Oop. Ah. And this was going to be the beginning of my talk, which was I was going to, um, and then I kind of reshuffled it when the, with the, 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 the New York Times and um, recent science paper. Um, I was going to reflect on, you know, there's a lot going on in the world. <laughs> and it's really easy to feel overwhelmed. Um, and, um, you know, I think a lot of us can relate. When I, when I was little, this is a picture of me um, when I was a kid. And some of my earliest memories are um, having this sense that I wanted to do something purposeful with my life, that I wanted to change the world, as cliche as that sounds. Um, and, and obviously I didn't, um, or maybe not obviously, but I did not envision that as being um, a, a bat biologist. Um, I didn't really even envision it being a, um, a wildlife biologist. Um, but that, that has been the way that I have chosen um, to have an impact on the world. And, you know, as we have faced this global pandemic and, and the, I live in California, so, you know, we, we're dealing with the, the real impacts of climate change in our daily lives. Um, I've had time to reflect on this, on my childhood ambition and ask myself if I'm living up um, to her aspirations. And so I just wanna close with, um, I think that um, the, the thing that kind of carries me through and, the, and where I get my sense of resilience about the work that I do is that we, we are making a difference in, um, and, and, and being dedicated and in, in, in thinking about um, the ways that we can um, talk about complex issues that integrate um, science and, and conservation and value and the connections between this planet and, um, and our own uh, well-being um, are, um, it's how we're going to, it's how we're, it's, it's, it's what we have to do and it's how we're going to uh, make a difference. And so um, with that, um, I will uh, open it up for any questions. And this is my, this is my kid. <laughs> so going to make a better future for the next generation. Thank you, um, Dr. Frick, for that wonderful presentation. Um, just for the attendees, um, we've got about 25 minutes um, for questions. And if you have questions, please go ahead and enter those into the Q&A um, box that should be at the bottom of your screens. Um, we may not have the opportunity to answer all of our questions, but we certainly um, welcome questions from the audience. And with that, I'll go ahead and read our first question. Um, so this question is from an attendee that asks, uh, where there are multiple species of bats living in one cave, do they hybridize? No. And maybe a follow-up, what would prevent them from hybridizing or what might be a barrier there? Um, well, they're, I, yeah, I mean, just oftentimes they're not even closely related species. So um, I don't think there's very many examples of hybridization in, in mammals in general. Um, and I'm certainly not aware of any in bats, um, but oftentimes, you know, like um, for the example in the, um, uh, the Jamaica cave example I gave that has a dozen species that sometimes there are different families that are there's uh, individuals of species from like, uh, I think, mm, at least a couple different families. So they're they're very distantly related. So our next question is, are bat species concentrated in biodiversity hotspots? Yes, yeah, so the diversity of bats is concentrated in tropical latitudes. There's actually a very strong gradient in um, uh, bat diversity from tropical to, so with the with the peak of diversity being in tropical latitudes. Mm -hmm. One of our attendees, an anonymous attendees asks, 
A number of years ago, the Oregon Coast Aquarium hosted a traveling exhibit featuring bats. This exhibit focused on educating the public, but specifically children. Are any of the initiatives um, at BCI focused on reaching youth? Um, we have definitely had a lot of um, youth focused um, programs in our past. Um, and I think, you know, we have a lot of materials that are focused on youth. Um, right now, our Inspire Through Experience programs are um, uh, focused on um, in, um, inviting people to come watch the emergence at Bracken Cave, um, which is um, obviously very kid friendly. Um, and then um, our bat walks program, which can involve children, but isn't necessarily directed at children. But yeah, there's been a, um, historically BCI has done a lot with um, educating the youth. And I think that's made, um, been really impactful. We also have a, um, like a bat squad program that has um, uh, engaged uh, kids in um, uh, sort of, you know, bat um, education materials. And we have a, a bats magazine that has um, some elements for kids too. So uh, a question, we are very concerned about white nose, white nose syndrome in the United States. What do you see as the most effective way to encourage people to stay away from caves to slow the spread of the fungal disease? That's a great question. So I've worked extensively on white nose syndrome and I, um, it was actually very unusual for me to do an entire talk without even a slide on white nose syndrome. Um, and, um, you know, there's been an, um, so for those who don't know what white nose syndrome is, it's a disease that's been caused by a, a fungal pathogen that was introduced um, uh, or got to uh, North America roughly a decade ago and it has caused um, devastating declines across uh, multiple species. We've lost uh, millions of bats and a couple of species are now threatened with um, local to regional to um, global extinction. Um, the fungus is a, a spread ac across North America uh, fairly rapidly over the past decade. Um, you can't tell bats to socially distance. Um, and, um, but you can ask people to not um, uh, go into caves that have white nose and, and spread the fungus around. So there was a lot of outreach that happened with caving groups um, and, and, and researchers and, and a lot of education around decontamination um, of, of their gear. So um, we know ways in which we can uh, kill the fungus so that it's not um, on um, people's um, gear is and 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 so that those are really important. You can you can get that information on the whitenosesyndrome.org website, um, and not moving between areas where uh, white nose is currently found and in going in underground into other areas. So anybody who does research doesn't move equipment um, between different places. Um, there's been different levels of, of cave restriction, um, access restrictions that's been a little bit jurisdictionally um, variable. So like there's certain areas of the Forest Service that have put restrictions on, on, on people going underground, um, but that hasn't been um, a, a, a universal approach. So really, I think, you know, education and outreach and in, in communicating to the people who are um, going underground and, and telling them about best practices um, to avoid um, spreading it. Um, another audience member asks, what would you say is the biggest barrier to bat conservation globally? Is it persistent negative public perceptions, limited scientific knowledge, limited governmental conservation policies and protections or something else? Um, that's a great question. I mean, I, I think it's one of these things where there's not like a single, there's not a single answer, right? And, and you're talking about the whole world. And so there's going to be regional and local contacts. Um, so certainly um, data gaps and knowing, um, uh, you know, um, knowing how best to achieve conservation, working, I think, um, global capacity for both research and conservation, helping um, uh, build up um, better better capacity in country. We have a student scholarship program um, that we actually fund um, uh, graduate students around the world um, to do to do research on um, priority topics. Um, and but also, you know, like the um, 
all of the challenges that I think that we face in the conservation arena in terms of that integration between um, working with local communities um, and trying to uh, build sustainable human economies that aren't um, reliant on um, habitat destruction um, and, and, and exploitation. So there's not a, um, but I, I do think that our, one of the things that's unique about bats is, uh, or not unique, but that, that is true for bats is that is um, a sense of data deficiency. Although we do know a lot too. So am I, am I being like sort of a politician, like sort of answering on both sides of that coin there? I'm seeing a couple of questions from students that are curious about how you got into bat research and how they might do the same. Um, well, I got, I, so I was interested in, in um, conservation biology as an undergrad and did a lot of field courses um, and then was getting ready to go back to grad school and volunteered with somebody who was a, um, a consultant that was specializing in um, like bat mitigation and um, uh, and then we fell in love <laughs> and he's now my husband. Um, so that's like, that's a little bit of a unique path. I don't, <laughs> it's not necessarily a good <laughs> translatable model. Um, but I think, you know, in terms of the question of like how to get involved, um, really if you're a student, um, finding a researcher that has um, uh, uh, research projects um, ongoing and being able to, um, um, get involved in their research um, is often a great way to get some experience. Um, attending, once we get back to being able to attend meetings, the um, here in the US, the North American Symposium of Bat Research happens every year. And it's a very inclusive, encouraging and student oriented community. And it's a great place to meet people and find out what kinds of research projects are going on and, and um, sort of network. There's also um, a network of different kinds of working groups. So there's like the Western Bat Working Group. Um, and um, those are typically a little bit more of like applied um, kind of management uh, less research, um, but they are also a, a, another pathway to meet people and get involved and see what projects are going on. Um, and yeah, I think there's also the North American Bat Monitoring Program, which is a continental scale monitoring program that's just being stood up um, and getting going. And there might be some um, opportunities to get involved with that because it's a, a pretty large scale effort to um, be able to determine the status and trends of bats across um, the US and Canada. And so there's um, starting to be regional hubs stood up where um, you could probably work on get, being engaged with folks who are conducting different kinds of bat research, mostly through acoustic monitoring. I, I will also use this as an opportunity then to also say that right now, so there, there had been a, um, uh, some of these uh, regional groups were also hosting things like bat blitzes of like coordinated um, campaigns to go out and, and miss net and sample bats. Um, but a lot, uh, there's kind of a, a, a pause on that right now because of the concerns about um, the, the potential for um, people with, um, to actually expose bats to the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Um, um, we know that um, bats can carry beta coronaviruses in Asia, but there's not, um, um, it's, um, there haven't been documentation of, of North American bats um, hosting beta coronaviruses. And there's some concern that um, if we exposed bats to SARS-CoV-2, that um, they could get sick and that that would be, um, and you know, those of us who've worked on white nose are really not interested in what might happen <laughs> of introducing a novel, um, uh, a novel pathogen to naive North American bat populations. Another one of our audience members asks, are there particular geographic areas that are more data deficient in terms of bat population trends and status than other areas of the world? Yes, let me share my screen again. I had this little secret sneaky slide. Um, Yes, so the data deficient bats. So if there was another layer of this of just bat diversity, it would also be highlighted in those tropical regions as I mentioned earlier. Um, but as you can see, our data deficient um, hotspots are in the Amazon basin and, and equatorial latitudes of Africa. 
and to and also in in parts of Southeast Asia. Um, and then um, the with the threatened um, hotspots are also in on on islands and um, Southeast Asia. Of course, this is IUCN data, so there's a little bit of um, sort of reporting bias in this as well, but this gives you a general sense of global trends. So next question, aside from white noise syndrome research, how closely do you work with biologists, uh, zoonotic disease researchers? And do you think current research effort, efforts looking for emergent diseases in wildlife human interfaces are sufficient? Um, so um, at BCI, um, other than being sort of involved with sort of some of these like sort of global networks, um, we don't, we don't currently have any research at BCI um, uh, that's conducting ourselves any sort of one health type approaches. Um, um, I do think that the, the research that is being done in a one health context of really thinking about um, the integration between um, ecology, conservation, virology, immunology, and like global health and wildlife health um, is really important work to be done. Um, I think that um, there's been some great groups that have made a lot of progress, but I think this is an area that um, we need sustained and continued attention and funding. And these are complex problems and they're gonna take sort of integrated um, and focused attention to um, figure out how to resolve. Another audience member asks, you mentioned that only a portion of bats live in natural caves. How often do bats find other suitable habitat if their normal habitat is lost? And could there be opportunities for humans to provide habitat in more densely populated areas to help maintain bat populations? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, there are a number of bat species that are, um, I think we could consider human commensals that are really flexible in terms of their roosting strategy. So it's always, always good to remember that, you know, you know, there's 1400, there's 1400 plus bat species around the world. So when we talk about bats, we're talking about a really big diverse group, right? Um, and, um, but yes, there are some species that are um, perfectly willing, if not at this point, prefer to live in, in human um, created structures. So um, here in North America, for example, there's a lot of bats that live in mines, which are um, cave analogs, but they're actually human created um, 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 you know, habitats. Um, there's also a number of species that are perfectly um, happy to, to roost in, in, in bat boxes, right? And then there's bats that are in attics and barns. And um, I have actually a, a, a colony of big brown bats that live in the little eaves of my, uh, of my house. Um, totally unplanned. They just colonized it. So it was, but it was fun. Um, and so, yeah, there, there are some species that do um, better in, in proximate, proximity to humans and other species that really need like, you know, um, uh, large tracts of intact forest, right? Um, so I think that there, um, there's definitely um, opportunity to think about ways in which we can create and, and provide protected, um, either artificially created or natural habitats um, that are in, um, you know, complex landscapes that don't necessarily, um, um, like, you know, we'd also know that bats um, forage over agricultural crops, um, and they are important consumers of agricultural insects. Um, and so I think, you know, we can, um, we can envision a, a scenario in which um, we have healthy bat populations in, in complex landscapes, but they do need to have some component of, 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 of available forage, um, either um, whether that's insects or um, um, in, in tropical areas, uh, nectar and, 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 and seeds, um, and then roost sites that are protected from disturbance and, um, and, and yeah, the, the places where bats can go and be safe. <laughs> Is it known what degree bats are impacted by chemicals, pesticides traveling up the food chain? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, it's sort of a, an oddly understudied topic. Um, so when we were writing the sort of global review um, paper, looking at all the different threats, it, it, it's notable that there hasn't been more research on that. Um, 
it's um, pretty logical to presume that um, bats are impacted by heavy pesticide use because they're, um, you know, feeding um, uh, on insects. Um, and, um, but yeah, there, that's an area where we really need to be thinking about um, both um, direct effects as well as um, sort of like sublethal lethal effects, whether that's an, it, you know, influencing reproductive success. I, th that said, I, one of my um, uh, first uh, research papers was actually looking at the effects of a large contaminant spill um, in the Sacramento River um, in, in Northern California on survival rates and what um, basically the train was carrying a large amount of pesticides and it spilled over into the Sacramento River, which is that a lot um, uh, bats like to forage over over riparian areas. And um, the effects of that um, contaminant spill did uh, lower um, juvenile survival of those uh, bat species for, for years afterwards. We have a question about um, monitoring and detecting bats. Mm -hmm. um, this audience member is curious if there's new technology or AI um, or acoustic monitoring that's increasing bat detection rates. And then in conjunction with that, um, is noise pollution a problem for bats in the same way it is for marine mammals? Yeah, um, in terms of the acoustic monitoring, yes, acoustic monitoring is one of the uh, really important tools in our toolbox for studying bats. Um, bats make uh, ultrasonic calls um, uh, when they're echolocating and um, and so there's been um, quite a bit of um, advancement, both in the in terms of the hardware, in terms of um, options for uh, recording bats. Um, uh, we can now record bats in full spectrum. Um, recording bats is, is more challenging than recording birds because they're calling um, in, in ultrasonic frequencies. Um, uh, but, and then um, bats are using echolocation to find uh, prey items. And so they're not as easy to classify to species as say birds, because birds are using song to advertise um, themselves for mates. So there's a, there's a um, incentive to use a call that is uh, a, a unique signature to your species. Um, whereas bats are using um, sound to efficiently detect prey items. And so there's, that lends itself to both um, there being um, a lot of variability within a species and then a lot of overlap among species. And so that makes classifying signatures um, to species challenging, but there's a lot of development in terms of machine learning algorithms. Um, so the ability to now record for really long periods of time in full spectrum and then process those data, um, those data streams in efficient ways. Um, and um, so, yeah, it's a, it's a really important tool. There's a number of, of, of um, companies out there that make uh, commercial bat detectors. Um, there's also the open source um, bat detectors called the Audiomoths, which are um, uh, um, at the lower end of the price scheme. There's a, the, it's such a specialized field that um, um, a lot of the commercial bat detectors cost a lot, although you can get, it's, there's a, the, um, the echo meter touch that's made by wildlife acoustics um, that can like plug into your smartphone and then it can um, hear the echolocation calls of the bats and 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 give you a, a best guess at what species flying around so that's been kind of a, a nice thing to kind of um, at the hobby level to be able to kind of enjoy um, what bats are flying around um, Noise pollution, yes. Um, there are some folks who are working on that and, and there's some evidence that noise pollution um, can impact um, uh, bat populations, especially there's a number of species that have, um, that do what we call passive listening. So they have like, like really large ears and they're like, I, I, I study pallid bats in, in the desert in Baja and um, for their, actually hunting for scorpions and other large ground arthropods. And so they'll fly close to the ground and be listening for the sounds of scorpions or things scuttling on the, on the floor. Um, and a researcher, um, Jesse Barber at University of Idaho is, has looked at ways in which um, different ambient noises can impact that ability um, to, to hear, hear prey. So we have a question about wind turbines and bats. So this person is curious about the pros and cons and how wind tur turbine design and technology may affect bats. 
Yeah, so unfortunately, wind turbines kill a lot of bats. Um, bats collide with turbines. Um, and there is a substantial body of evidence that, um, that turbines um, uh, kill large numbers of bats. Uh, they tend to kill bats during the migratory season in the autumn um, and on low wind speed nights. Um, and they disproportionately kill more micro, what we call the migratory tree roosting bats. So um, in North America, uh, our bat fauna is sort of divided into bats that like to hibernate underground and bats that um, do seasonal uh, migrations and, and don't, don't roost underground, like roost up in the foliage of trees. And so that's things like the hoary bat and the eastern red bat um, and silver-haired bats. And they are disproportionately killed uh, by turbines. We're still uh, not totally clear why they are killed um, in such large numbers compared to other bats. Um, there's a number of good hypotheses out there and investigations going on. But what we do know is we know how to, to fix the problem. We know that um, by changing the cut-in speed, so changing the, um, the speed at which we allow the turbine blades to spin, um, that that um, reduces um, the number of bats killed by about 60%. Um, unfortunately, that's really hard to convince the wind industry to adopt as an operational practice um, because it's those low wind speeds that, you know, they, they want, they're in the business of generating power from wind. And, um, and so, you know, that's um, something that we're, you know, working on and trying to really um, determine ways in which um, we can take um, the, the um, uh, you know, something that is a, a has a, a evidence of a solution and get it adopted it, it, as a practice. Um, of course, wind energy, wind energy is an important part of um, a sustainable renewable energy um, uh, market, um, but we also need to balance that, the need for renewables and, and lowering our, um, finding ways to produce carbon-free energy with also, um, you know, not causing biodiversity loss. And we've got just a couple of minutes left. So this might be our last question. Um, one of our audience members asks, do you think that bat research will continue business as usual after the pandemic is over? Um, I think that um, we'll all, I think that there is um, an attention to the need for um, good field hygiene, and um, and I think that we'll probably have some some PPE required. Like I think a lot of us will probably think a little bit differently about um, social distancing. Um, and I think one of, there's something really easy that we can do when we're working with bats, which is to to wear a face covering. Um, uh, and so I I think that um, that um, that yeah, I don't. I think I think there'll be a movement to be more conscious about um, protecting bats. Um, but I I do think that the energy and focus on the importance of bat research and conservation will um, will be will be there. Uh, with that, I think we may might have time for one short little question. But people are wondering what is maybe one or two things that they can do in uh, their yard or in their community to help bats? Um, well, I think, you know, all the things that you do to um, reduce your impact, um, reduce your carbon footprint and protect the planet benefits bats. Um, so the things that you might do like bike commuting versus um, driving your car, uh, not that very many of us are commuting anymore. Um, and, uh, you know, I think, um, you know, Spreading the love about bats, talking positively about bats. Um, this sounds a little self-promotional, but joining an organization like Bat Conservation International or another organization that you care about that is doing work um, on the ground to um, promote the the causes that you care about. Um, I think those have um, that um, are great ways to express support and um, um, and make a difference. With that, I think we're almost right at time. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Frick, for joining us today and sharing about your research and perspectives on um, bat conservation. Thank you to all of our audience members that submitted questions. We really appreciate the thoughtful discussion and you really um, tested Dr. Frick in terms of asking about a range of different topics. Um, we'd like to, again, thank the funders for the um, EECB series here at Oregon State University. 
And also we're gonna just give a little quick advertisement for next week's talk, which is gonna be um, at the same place, same time. I'm gonna share a slide here. Um, so next week we'll be welcoming um, Wendy Turner from SUNY Albany, and she'll be talking about anthrax transmission in African wildlife. Um, but with that, I think um, we're gonna wrap up our seminar for today. So thank you everyone.